Winning from the pandemic, big tech firms are making gains as the coronavirus is taking its toll worldwide. Many are hiring, while millions of people are being laid off. So what's driving this boom in this time of crisis? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the programme today with me, Peter Dobby. We are no longer physically shopping or eating in restaurants and a flight to one of the world's favourite destinations is now just a dream. The measures we're taking to save our lives during the coronavirus pandemic are disrupting businesses around the world. But staying at home with our only windows to the outside world being a Wi-Fi connection and a device is changing our consumption habits and benefiting the big major tech companies. We are buying groceries, medicines and pet food online. We're working and learning online. We're replacing traveling by surfing online. You get where we're going with this. Tech companies are thriving. Amazon alone hiring 100,000 new staff. Zoom Video, that website you've heard of, is now believed to be worth $44 billion. Let's get an idea of how much we're now relying on technology then. Well, sales of over-the-counter medicine for colds rose ninefold on Amazon in the United States during the month to mid-March from the year earlier. Downloads of Netflix's video app jumped 66% in Italy alone. WhatsApp, the messaging service and voice calling service, has doubled its traffic in volume. The number of users on Microsoft Teams messaging application has grown by 37% in one week to more than 44 million users per day. iPhone app sales in the US recently have risen by 20% and Android app sales by 14%. Okay, let's bring in our guest. Joining us today from New York, we have John Biggs. He's an editor at Coindesk, a digital currency and financial technology website. From Vienna, we have Mark Kugelbeck. He's a professor at the University of Vienna and a member of the European Commission's expert group on artificial intelligence. In Enschede, in the Netherlands, we have Nolan Gertz. He's a technology ethicist and a professor at the University of Twente. Welcome to you all. John Biggs in New York, coming to you first. Who's doing well here and why? <laughs> doing well? Uh, well, considering I'm basically still in my pajamas and haven't had a haircut in about uh, three weeks, it's not me exactly. But um, in terms of technology, in terms of the technologies that we're using right now, we're seeing a lot of the things that were promised come to fruition. Uh, unfortunately, it's under duress and it's under, uh, and it's under the, uh, uh, a great deal of pain right now. Um, but a lot of the networks, all of the networking effects that we're promised uh, by the internet are actually coming to, uh, to become valuable. Mark Kuckelbeck in Vienna. Are we talking here about trends that are being accelerated, trends that were going to happen anyway? So it's like a, a quick cook on something. Well, yes, because there was already a kind of digitalization process happening where, where work and life was um, already very much mediated by, by electronic digital technologies. Um, and now, of course, because of the crisis, this is all um, increasing. Um, so it's interesting to see what's going to happen. Unfortunately, the ethical problems are also uh, you know, increasing uh, and, and on the table now. Um, things to do with privacy, um, dangers that, that are there uh, towards author authoritarianism. Um, so that we see as well. Nolan Gertz in Enschede. Uh, this is good news, clearly, for people like YouTube and Netflix. Who is it bad news for? Yeah, I would say this is uh, bad news right now for uh, small competitors uh, who wanted to try to uh, be different. Uh, as we can see, for example, in the education sector with Zoom, uh, becoming immediately the uh, standard, it seems that almost any other uh, video conferencing platform that wanted to actually focus on privacy, uh, as happened, for example, when competitors with Facebook wanted to focus on privacy, uh, they just kind of lose out to the name brand. And because of how fast uh, people were being pushed to move online, uh, this again pushed towards uh, name recognition wins the day. 
John Biggs in New York, coming back to you in your gym jams, John. Uh, did this <laughs> come along at precisely the right time for Netflix? So clearly, their PR people would never be tone deaf enough to say that anywhere publicly or even email each other about it. Mm -hmm. But Netflix's success is built on massive amounts of debt. Sure. Well, I mean, if you if you want to call uh, if you want to call that sort of investment in as uh, debt, it basically opens up a um, it opens up an entirely new world of streaming to uh, streaming opportunities for Netflix for folks like Hulu, um, especially in the U.S. You're you're not it's not just Netflix. Uh, if anybody lost out, I think it might be Disney. Disney um, Disney is offering all of its movies and things, but it's not offering fresh content. So. Sure, the kids are going to stare at Little Mermaid all day, but they're not going to. But the parents aren't going to want to uh, re-up when this is over. Um, and but it also points to a different, a different view of uh, or a different way of streaming um, video. We're basically pumping constant content into people's homes now in ways that we never could before. It used to be a a cable stream uh, where you have a channel that just kept on going and going, whereas now you have uh, you have a panoply of things that you could have access to. Pardon me for yep. interrupting you there, John. I just want to take that point to Nolan in Enschede. The, can the global infrastructure cope moving forward? Because if so many more people are working from home, they then go from working at home in front of a bookshelf, usually, as far as I'm aware, then they go to the kitchen table, they put on their iPad or they get their iPad to talk to their big speaker so they can stream radio to listen to the news, and then they go online and start talking to people around the world. What is interesting to think about how uh, we already talked about the idea that we're, we're online so much that it feels like uh, we never live anywhere else anymore. Uh, we could see this, for example, in the uh, release of, uh, I think it's pronounced Quibi, Quibi uh, yesterday, a, a Netflix that was uh, going to offer 10-minute shows uh, with the idea that uh, I need to be able to watch content constantly, even just walking uh, from my house to the bus stop and then from the bus stop to work. So again, this idea that uh, we see this in advertisements all the time, where people are being presented staring at their phones to the detriment of reality. And this is seen not as a mark against tech companies, but actually as a selling point. We're increasingly living in a, a world that's crushing around you. Why would you want to look at anything except fantasy on your phone? Mark, can you develop for us your ideas or your worries about the way that potentially here could certain governments or certain, say, home ministries tilt from being aware of what we're doing to recording what we're doing, to observing what we're doing. And it would be an easy pivot for them to make to go down that road and get on the bus towards being authoritarian. That's definitely a danger. I must say, not only with, with governments, but also with, with big corporations, um, uh, as, as, we, you know, as we know. Um, but when it comes to governments, um, I was surprised how easy it is, um, you know, using the argument of a crisis to to take uh, measures that normally only are taken in a in an authoritarian uh, kind of environment, and how easy people accept these measures. Um, uh, also, I think you know the technologies we have today are very powerful. Uh, artificial intelligence, all kind of smart technologies, are very powerful. Uh, tools to to do that to um, increase surveillance. So uh, there's definitely a risk there, and I think in these times we become very well aware of that. Um, and and we should really uh, make sure that that next time we're better prepared for for this kind of discussions. On top of that, John Biggs in New York, there are kind of trust issues there, aren't there as well? Because the technology is so good and so user friendly, but you could end up in a situation where someone's watching you watching someone else. And if you talk about Zoom, very specifically about Zoom, there are security issues with that particular platform. And unless you get those security proxies set up properly, when you download that app, you could potentially be in a lot of trouble. Well, I mean, I think my, uh, my view is that everyone's going to be naked on the internet for uh, 15 minutes in the future. It's the, it's the old, um, it's the old Andy Warhol uh, uh, yarn. So I think we're in a position right now where we're trying to figure out how these things are going to be integrated into our lives. Uh, we used Zoom every day anyway before this. Now we use it. Now our kids are using it, which is a little bit more, a uh, little bit more distressing. Um, in terms of this becoming a command and control system, 
Potentially, uh, but one of the things I like to say is the internet routes around damage. If we ever got to a position where, yeah, we were getting uh, we we're getting poor information, we were all being forced to stay inside be because of some invisible threat, uh, the internet probably would route around that information and give us the uh, give us the real dope. Unfortunately, that leads to conspiracy theories, all the other good stuff. So we're we're really uh, bringing a lot of things to a head. It's as you said, it was a fast cook uh, to get a lot of the things in front of people that may or may not have had access to this before. 80-year-olds are using Zoom. Uh, my mom is trying to get a Polish television uh, sent to her, her laptop, something that she never thought that she ever wanted to have, but now all of a sudden it, it seems like a, a good idea because she has nothing else to do. Does that mean, however, John, when your mother watches Polish television, does that mean that the advertisers are making money or not? Because advertising revenue within this, this paradigm for some people has fallen off a cliff, for other people it's gone through the roof. Uh, definitely. In this specific case, the advertisers are probably making money. They're still advertising Polish products to a Polish diaspora who may or may not want to go out to the Polish store down the street. And especially if you live in New York, you can kind of get that. Uh, whereas on Twitter and a number of other places, they're not advertising. This doesn't make any sense to advertise, primarily because nobody has any cash to advertise, right? Uh, so on, on Twitter, you're going to notice a lot, uh, far fewer advertisements um, I, uh, the most I ever saw, the, the biggest advertisement I saw recently was for Quibi, and that's because they raised $2 billion for this, uh, for this goofy project that they have. Uh, and they launched at exactly the wrong time because people want to ease into this sort of content as opposed to, uh, just jump into it, uh, as they're being forced to do. There's so much other stuff that they could be doing right now versus, and they're, and a lot of people aren't on uh, subways either. So it's kind of silly for them to uh, try to launch right now, but uh, we'll see how that goes. Nolan Gertz in Enschkede coming back to you for a second. For the people who've, the, the legacy companies, the Facebooks, the Twitter, the WhatsApps and what have you, not the companies that do similar jobs in other parts of the world, but the companies that want to make money and have made a lot of money historically, is there a supply and a demand question for them? Yes, there's supply and demand clearly, but the supply routes have been cut or interrupted by COVID-19, by, by the fact that people cannot buy literally the hardware because the planes cannot fly the cargo from A to B, for example, into a country like China, where you've got that umbrella effect of a quite, quite authoritarian government anyway. Is there a get around for the companies that want to make money or not? Yeah, I think when you're talking about uh, entertainment companies, they're, uh, they're certainly happy to supply you with... Uh, endless amounts of mindless diversion that's been around for decades, uh, as we can see with uh, HBO, for example, suddenly releasing its entire library for free. Uh, and you get the feeling that it's almost, uh, you know, like a drug dealer uh, trying to give you a taste uh, to get you hooked for when they do move back to a uh, proprietary model. And it is interesting thinking about also, uh, you know, things like Amazon, uh, other similar companies that are focusing on delivery, uh, that they are ramping up uh, there are people, they're basically the only ones who are hiring right now. Uh, so that basically as the uh, workforce is dwindling uh, from one sector, they're getting sucked up into Amazon. So while at the same time, more and more people are becoming dependent on Amazon uh, for products, they're also becoming dependent on it uh, for their income. Mark in Vienna, could this lead to a long lasting change? The simplest things, according to Commerce IQ, dog food, toilet paper, the sales of those globally have gone up by a factor of 13. So in six months or a year, why go around your big local supermarket to buy dog food and toilet paper when you can just do one-click shopping and it turns up on your doorstep 24 hours later? Mm. Yeah, I mean, probably the, the local things like groceries and, and, and perhaps the toilet paper are gonna, gonna stay local, but... Um, it, it is true that many people find out now that um, a lot of things can be ordered online. Um, so this is, the, in terms of you know, winners and, and losers, this is definitely, um, th these companies are going to be on the, on the winning side uh, of, of this, this story. Who's going to be on the winning side when it comes to people like Google and Microsoft for you, John Briggs, in New York? I mean, those two companies are drowning in money. They're drowning in big, fat bank accounts. And yet still, they feel the need 
to offer discounted rates to, quote, new customers. Does that kind of go down the road of, yeah, it's, it's what Nolan was saying, you know, it's kind of like a crack dealer saying, try this stuff, it's really good. Oh, and by the way, when you come back next week, it's doubled in price. Sure. Well, I mean, that's that's fairly common in, uh, in Silicon Valley. That's sort of uh, the cost of the total cost of ownership for a uh, for a customer to grab a customer costs quite a bit. But once you have them, once you have them nabbed, they're going to stay there forever. Um, there are some startups that like House Party, for example, it got suddenly got pretty popular uh, and their their whole cost per customer is fairly low because people just sign up. It's sort of viral. Um, Amazon is going to be the winner here. Something like a Walmart's going to be a loser. Uh, mom and pop stores are going to be losers. Restaurants are going to be are going to change the way they work. Um, the question was, does the world change after this? I think the I think there's a um, I think there's a general acceptance of online uh, work from home, online schooling uh, that we didn't have before. That's going to happen. Uh, but I don't think that bars and restaurants are going to let themselves get taken down so easily. And I think there's going to be a situation where. A lot of the hygiene and a lot of the things that we forgot about over the years is going to come back and improve, and we're going to want to leave our homes, at least for this summer. I think it'll be a summer of love, quote unquote, if you want to call it that. Uh, but we're definitely going to go back in front of the screens, and I think a lot of companies are actually going to say, "Hey, we don't have to spend two thousand, eight thousand, ten thousand, a hundred thousand dollars on this on this office when all we have to do is just give people laptops and let them go." Um, and I think that's going to be a really, really big change globally. Will we maybe, Nolan Gertz, get sick and tired of not surveillance capitalism, but what it might become, you know, surveillance capitalism on steroids, in as much as if I engage with a picture on my Instagram of, say, workout equipment, funnily enough, 12 hours later, this happened to me two days ago, I get hit with adverts for buy this gym equipment because you can't go to your gym. So some algorithm someplace engages with me engaging with something else. And if we're all buying and shopping and doing stuff online, you're going to get hit with page after page after page of this stuff. Right, and I think this is really my main concern is the degree to which we just become accustomed to this as just part of everyday life. And what we really need to be worried about is uh, this concept of, of what we think of as normal. And right now, uh, things are abnormal, uh, and they're going to be sort of the bedrock for what becomes normal afterwards. So now that we are, for example, teaching classes online, uh, students are increasingly expected to uh, be taught by their parents. Uh, you can imagine that this will become seen as sort of a go-to model uh, that is always in the background. So, for example, if there are uh, disputes, uh, labor disputes in the future, uh, this can be held over, that we know that we can uh, simply uh, fire and replace people uh, with videos. We could fire and replace people with their parents. We can, uh, as John was just mentioning, uh, close down entire offices if we need to. We can have remote offices. We could have uh, entire industries run by other countries, as we've been doing uh, more and more with customer service. So I think it is uh, very worrying uh, what, what right now uh, is seen as sort of a salve for our current crisis uh, might come back to hurt us uh, in the near future. Mark in Vienna, I guess what we're talking about here as well is the people who will survive this migration across to all these new platforms. It's about them monetizing information for their financial benefit. But if you're ingesting information at this rate all the time on your iPad, on your phone, on your device, on your talk to something on, on the garden window ledge, say, and it hears your voice and you say, do something, and it does it. Isn't there a chance, though, that you also ingest disinformation and fake news also is multiplied exponentially? Yes, that, that's certainly a danger. Um, now, on, on the positive side um, is that this, this whole situation can be seen as a gigantic social experiment where we try out how is it when we when we replace face-to-face uh, -face contact with all these these uh, technological uh, ways of, of doing things and um, I think it also gives us an opportunity to reflect um, what is this technology uh, what place uh, should this technology have in our lives um, how do I deal with fake news for example um, how can people be supported in, in dealing with fake news? What was the role of the media there? Um, so, so I think it's also an opportunity to, to reflect and to, um, 
to take some some um, some action to to mitigate these these effects. John, in New York, we kind of touched on this already briefly. Which industries, which professions can move over, can migrate? And I'm also thinking, particularly right now, you can't have the doctors and the nurses being replaced by artificial intelligence. Not yet, because if you're in a situation where every hospital around the world is, in effect, an ICU ward, a massive ICU ward, you mm -hmm. still need those specialists, those cardiologists, those specialists, the nurses, you know, in ICU to keep you alive. I think, I think, fortunately, I think at this point it's unable. We're unable to replace those with AI robotics. Um, uh, let's go back to the industry question first. The industry question is who wins here? Knowledge workers, uh, as you said, call centers, as you said, programmers, designers, that sort of thing. And the the divide between the knowledge worker and I guess the wet worker, the physical worker is gonna become even bigger, um, given that a receptionist isn't needed anymore to, to manage the office. You lose a lot of these, uh, these lower paying jobs that were great for people with a little bit less education, uh, who are gonna be sitting there and, um, and doing the, doing quote unquote menial work, which is vital for an office, but is not vital for a, um, for a um, online presence. In terms of doctors, in terms of, uh, in terms of actual physical interaction with patients, that's going to take a minute. Uh, I do see a day in the near future. Um, I talk to a lot of futurists and I talk to a lot of uh, roboticists. I do see a day in the near future where a, uh, a robot robot comes in and um, a robot comes in and lifts uh, patients off of beds, takes care of patients, that sort of thing. And we're at that point now. Uh, but I think we need a much lighter touch right now. And that unfortunately puts uh, doctors and nurses into danger. Um, we'll see. We'll see how it. Uh, okay. We'll see how it works. Nolan Gertz in Enschede. Uh, the tech companies are. We're inviting them in to do it as well. They are entwining themselves through, in, underneath, around our lives. When all this settles down and maybe goes back to not the old normal but a new version of the old normal, how many of us will actually start pulling cables out of the wall and go and, and unplumbing all this stuff? Yeah, it is interesting to think about how uh, before all this, you might have said that uh, there's still a dominant feeling uh, of technophobia that it's, that's sort of keeping tech companies uh, from encroaching too much into our lives. And I wonder if now, uh, after coronavirus, we're going to move to something more like anthropophobia uh, or the sort of germophobia on steroids, where we'll have increasing concern about uh, even with doctors, uh, you know, uh, physical contact of any kind in the same way that we were moving away from, uh, you know, going to stores towards Amazon to then going away from uh, delivery workers to having Amazon drones, uh, you can imagine that increasingly you're going to have, on the one hand, uh, people who get more and more technophilic, uh, more and more in love with technology. And on the other hand, I think you're going to have pushback, uh, but probably from an increasing minority, uh, sorry, a decreasing minority of the population. Uh, where you're going to have, you know, a call to uh, stick with what we can trust, stick with each other, a call for solidarity, a call okay. for return to nature. Okay, Nolan, I'm going to stop you there. In 20 sec seconds, Mark, the industry calls it blitz scaling, growing at all costs. So it's good for the industry. In 20 seconds, answer me this. Is it good for us? Well, um, it's it's not going to be uh, good for us if we just keep using all these products without reflection, without being critical, uh, without thinking what do we really want. And um, I think it can be good for us if we uh, manage to uh, to you know, shape our lives and take control of this, um, and also politically to to have a kind of a governance framework uh, at all kind of levels, also globally that uh, sets down some rules for this, um, because otherwise we, we're going to be in trouble. OK, gentlemen, we have to leave it there. Many thanks to our guests. They were John Biggs, Mark Kuckelbach and Nolan Gertz. And thank you, too, for your company. You can see the programme again anytime via our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter at AJ Inside Story or tweet me. I'm at Peter Dobby One. From me, Peter Dobby and the team here in Doha, thanks for watching. I will see you very soon. For the moment, bye-bye.